Hey, how are you guys doing? My name is Kevin Davani. Welcome to the Total Bitcoin Podcast Show. I'm super excited uh, with, together with Stephanie von Jahn, my co-moderator again, to do this uh, conversation with Yuri de Gaia, who wrote a real and excellent piece called Bitcoin is a Tool for Secession and a bunch of other, you know, excellent articles. And he does, he has his own uh, podcast show called uh, Citadelium. So give it, uh, check it out, follow him on Twitter. And we're going to talk about a bunch of things. Yeah, we're going to talk about, you know, uh, how to, you know, the path to freedom and secession. Uh, to Citadel, free private cities, what's the essence of Bitcoin, you know, uh, where are we heading to, how is this evolving. So without further ado, then my talk together with Stephanie von Jan with Yuri de Gaia. Let me know what you think and drop me an email if you have any questions, suggestions, wishes. My email address is hello at thetotalconnector.com. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel, my podcast platforms, give it a follow on Twitter. It helps the algorithm as you, as you know, in, you know, in times of censorship. <laughs> and yeah, thanks so much. And taking your time, really looking forward to our talk. Uh, Yuri, uh, why don't you just start off introducing yourself because you're the first time on my show. Uh, I read your article and Stephanie uh, as well. And um, we were just uh, really uh, super, not only excited, but really it was fascinating, your articles. And you have, you have a bunch of content, I know, on podcasts, your own podcast and your other articles. I haven't read all of them. So I just want to tell you, you know, we, I'm, I'm really um, super fascinated by your articles and it aligns with a lot of, you know, values and uh, the essence, you know, of, of Bitcoin. So yes, uh, please thank you for yourself. inviting. Thank you for inviting. Yeah, and uh, happy to hear the feedback. So uh, definitely uh, feels like I'm not doing it uh, for no reason. And uh, to to uh, give you a short introduction, I, uh, I uh, got into Bitcoin about uh, late uh, 2012. Uh, before that, I wasn't really into Bitcoin, anything, uh, you know, uh, with finance, anything with economics. I actually didn't know pretty much anything about it. So everything I know right now is actually thanks to Bitcoin, right? So as they say, uh, Bitcoin born, molded by Bitcoin, made by it uh, completely. And um, uh, yeah, before my background was uh, completely different. I studied linguistics uh, back in Russia. And then uh, I uh, I think I read a bit about Bitcoin somewhere. Like like a lot of people uh, dismissed it at first, uh, and uh, then uh, it started popping up more and more on my screen because uh, I'm uh, I'm more of a nerdy type, so I like uh, to uh, get into uh, you know technology and learn about new things, and uh, you know uh, uh, hang around about uh, with uh, uh, computer programmers and uh, uh, other nerds, so to speak. Uh, and uh, I I really got into it. Uh, there was. Uh, uh, in Vancouver, in Canada, uh, I found a group uh, of uh, people, and there was literally three, four people meeting uh, every week to discuss Bitcoin, and uh, that's how I started going there and you know learning. That was the original uh, Bitcoin group in Vancouver, uh, which uh, obviously grew as time went uh, and as the price went, uh, uh, which uh, correlates a lot. Yeah, and. Um, you know, I uh, just uh, really thought this was something uh, not just interesting, but something uh, life changing, probably as I started learning uh, more about economics and finance. And I learned about how the world actually works, uh, not every facet of life, but at least the economic side of it, which is quite important because uh, pretty much everything that we have right now the situation in the world hinges upon the economy that we have and hinges upon the economic system that we have, which uh, I personally consider uh, uh, outright fraudulent, right? Just like many other Bitcoiners. So this was a big eye opener. And, uh, and uh, obviously I decided to, you know, uh, Get my uh, uh, get my uh, hands on Bitcoin, not in terms of buying it, but maybe trying to do something with it as well. And uh, the first thing, the lowest hanging fruit for me personally was just uh, pure and simple brokerage. You know, helping people buy and sell a little bit here and there. Um, at the same time. You know, as this progressed, I, I uh, wanted to start a more serious business. And this is how I uh, um, started a Bitcoin ATM uh, Canada uh, called the Honey Badger that right now is actually one of the largest networks, Bitcoin ATM networks in Canada. Um, uh, I exited it in 2018. And, and uh, also I uh, spent some time with uh, Binary Financial, uh, just doing some uh, high profile brokerage uh, deals, uh, so to say. And uh, 
by the end of uh, that uh, period, I decided that I wanted to branch off and uh, focus specifically on Bitcoin brokerage and uh, Bitcoin only brokerage, uh, nothing else, a pure Bitcoin company. And I wanted to build something that was built uh, not horizontally like a lot of other companies build when they just uh, list lots and lots of other coins, other, you know, blockchains. Uh, I wanted to build something horizontally um, on the Bitcoin uh, uh, platform uh, using all Bitcoin technologies, you know, like uh, uh, layer one, layer two technologies and something in between. And that's how I got interested in, uh, in other things like the liquid network and the lightning network. So right now, uh, long story short, I run a, a Bitcoin brokerage business called Bitcoin Reserve. And um, I also uh, write and I do uh, my podcast, Citadelium, which talks about Bitcoin and the possible future scenarios in which uh, uh, citadels uh, uh, spring up in the world and pretty much replace the current nation states. That's great. Yeah, he's there. So yeah, I'm still here. Yeah, I'm sorry. I just had to turn off my video because of bandwidth issues. Um, so, Yuri, we want to talk about your article, your excellent article, Bitcoin is a tool f um, uh, for secession. And there's one sentence right in the first paragraph that really caught my attention um, and, you know, aligns. I'm, I think I speak for Stephanie too, you know, um, with, the, with the essence of, of Bitcoin, you know, and the philosophy behind Bitcoin. You say in your article, throughout history, protests, revolutions, and civil wars proved to be ineffective against state tyranny. And so would you say, Yuri, that Bitcoin is truly the first um, tool or whatever you want to call it, like uh, the, uh, the first tool, the first uh, evolutionary tool that, you know, uh, makes us uh, not, you know, not to go into this direction again, you know, not into revolutions, you know, not to repeat uh, things again, but to, um, you know, evolve for the first time and do it peacefully, you know, and, and as peacefully as possible and transition into a new era. Um, I, don't, I don't know if you want to add something, Stephanie, to that, to my question, but you know where I'm going with this. Go ahead, Jody, I'm curious. <laughs> Yeah, well, um, as we like to say, uh, fix the money, fix the world, right? And this is a very powerful phrase because, uh, uh, as I just mentioned in my introduction, uh, a lot of the problems that we have right now in the world uh, are caused by this uh, uh, fraudulent financial system that we have that is essentially based on the fiat standard, the, the standard of fiat money, which is issued by uh, bureaucrats that no one elects, uh, that uh, yeah, with a you know uh, with a click of a button can print trillions of dollars as they have been doing in the recent months, and uh, this kind of shows that uh, uh, you know uh, the world cannot be run by just a few people in uh, dark suits uh, who I think that uh, this or that can be managed. You know, supply and demand and basic market forces can be managed by people, um, and. Uh, I think they actually don't think that too. That's why they are really headed into things like AI and stuff like that to kind of, you know, help them manage all that uh, uh, economy, so-called uh, maybe resource-based economy, as some people uh, uh, called it in the past. But uh, what I think uh, Bitcoin uh, provides is that uh, it gets us back to a universal monetary standard that was not... Uh, uh, possible before. Uh, before it was uh, gold that was the, the the standard around the world, and right now, uh, right now we see that uh, it's really difficult to get back to gold. Uh, there there have been lots of news. Uh, about uh, the gold market being heavily manipulated. And uh, uh, it's no wonder, obviously, that uh, a lot of the gold stashes are in the hands of uh, central banks themselves who are able then to manipulate the prices of gold all over the world by dumping on the, dumping on the market large quantities of gold if for some reason uh, regular people start uh, you know uh, uh, collecting gold and increasing its price due to due to uh, shortened demand uh, due to shortened supply but uh, with bitcoin it's a little bit different i think uh, uh, we live in the 21st century right now and uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, innovation going on and now we have the internet so we essentially invented a version of gold that is supercharged by the capabilities of the internet. And those capabilities are its uh, transportability, right? You can transfer gold anywhere, uh, uh, this digital gold, Bitcoin, anywhere in the world right now in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion 
without um, uh, without relying uh, on any third party. So uh, with a click of a button, you can transport it over a communications channel. That's what the internet provides. Then censorship resistance, which is basically the uh, absence of any third parties uh, and uh, absence of a pressure by any third party on your transactions. If you hold your private keys for Bitcoin, you are able to transfer it anywhere in the world and no one can tell you you cannot do that. They can try and they will try, but they can't really do anything about it. Um, of course, uh, a lot of people argue that, uh, you know, there will be all kinds of attacks done by the state, such as uh, speculative attacks or um, uh, what's called custody attacks, uh, for example. Uh, a good example would, uh, let's say, uh, PayPal and Coinbase and all the large... Uh, uh, Bitcoin companies and like the funds like uh, uh, GPTC, they collect a huge amount of Bitcoins and then uh, basically they will not release these Bitcoins from their uh, vaults. They will just kind of keep them as a, uh, in their own ecosystem and they will allow people to transact in Bitcoin. But essentially it won't be really Bitcoin because people will not hold their private keys. It will, it will be more like a PayPal transactions where numbers in the database, in a centralized database move rather than on the actual decentralized database, which is the blockchain. Um, I think uh, uh, this is the main premise here. The, the premise is that uh, we now have a tool that uh, cannot be controlled by the people who created the fraudulent system. They may use it because Bitcoin does not discriminate. They may use it, and I'm sure they are already using it, and they will use it even more in the future. But they will not be able to do what they did with gold. Uh, they will have to basically play by the rules of uh, Bitcoin. And Bitcoin, I think, has the best rules. It has the uh, best monetary policy out there. And um, I think Satoshi really, really envisioned the future in which uh, the uh, game theoretic aspects of Bitcoin uh, prevail over anything that we have right now. So uh, that's why I think it's extremely important. Yeah, sounds awesome. So I may add something. What I see that Bitcoin also provided, apart from like the technical functionalities, it really brought a paradigm. So the people started to think, okay, what is money? Um, it's really like in school, you're not really taught what money is or you're getting taught a false version on how new money is created, that it would be transferred, which it is not. It's created out of thin air. And you are going deeper and deeper into the rabbit hole. Then you realize, okay, the financial system is fraudulent. And then you're going even further and you're questioning the state and you're questioning the whole system that we live in. And as such, you realize that this system as it is, it doesn't serve the individual individual person, but in fact, it serves a smaller need. And this is the point where you then don't agree with the system anymore. So this is kind of the rabbit hole uh, process most Bitcoiners go through. And there are like more and more people now going through this rabbit hole. It can be like Bitcoin can be a starting point or like other things like medical system or whatever. There are like so many things where you can do a deep dive where when you when you dive deep, dive deep enough, you realize, OK, there's something fishy going on. But this is how Bitcoin really opened the way for quite many people to like wake up. And as uh, Mohir Rothbard said so nicely, the state or the government um, as it is, only can survive when it has the permission, the active or the passive permission by the people. And I think this is actually the great thing that um, Bitcoin brought with it, or one of the great things, because then this whole structure loses legitimization and then it cannot sustain itself and will crumble. Yes, exactly. And uh, you made a good point here that Bitcoin... For a lot of people, including myself, Bitcoin serves as a starting point uh, and opens uh, doorways to many other different rabbit holes. And uh, as you as you mentioned, it can be the medical system, it can be the food pyramid, it can be you know the sports, uh, the TV, and entertainment, and all of that stuff. Uh, it is uh, for for the most part, I actually think, uh, run by pretty much the same or at least similar interests and interest groups, right, who have a, a more or less kind of unified uh, uh, 
way of uh, looking at the world and looking at the populations of the world who for them are pretty much uh, as uh, you know as uh, morpheus uh, explained matrix uh, uh, a battery right they basically just need their energy to you know uh, feed off of uh, the populations and they devise all kinds of ways to do so and um, the current economic system is one of the major ways because uh, if you are able to uh extract people's value people's uh, fruits of labor through the monetary policy then you can rule pretty much uh, uh, the uh, the famous uh, phrase by Rothschilds right uh, uh, give me the uh, give me the power to rule uh, the monetary system and you know i care not who writes the law right so uh, things like that i think they are very important to understand and uh, that's why i think it's extremely important to uh, orange peel people into this thing uh, to give them uh, uh, to, to explain to them why uh, at least learning about how the world uh, works in terms of the monetary policy right now and why Bitcoin is different. But at the same time, um, you know, I, I believe that a lot of the people are not interested in it, even if you provide them with the facts. So uh, personally, I do not really spend my energy educating the vast masses. Uh, I would rather uh, provide my contact for people who are ready to listen, right? And there's not a, there's not a lot of people like that, but at the same time, you must understand that uh, it is not the masses that usually change things around in the world. It is usually uh, very few dedicated individuals who uh, create these paradigm shifts uh, and whom the masses follow. So uh, in simple terms, uh, and as uh, you know, some religious uh, uh, and spiritual leaders uh, say, people usually need a shepherd and then who that shepherd? Uh, who that shepherd is? That's the question, right? So right now, I think uh, a lot of the time, very very often, the shepherd is not a good person. It's uh, it's uh, it's these uh, financial elites and you know all kinds of elites that are not uh, very good people. They're not. They don't have the best. Uh, of uh, humanity in their in their mind, right? So uh, I think this is what Bitcoin. Uh, uh, gives uh, to the rest of us it's uh, it's pretty much an equalizer it gives us an equal uh, opportunity uh, to uh, start uh, competing with these elements in our society and showing them that uh, you know um, the human spirit the human ingenuity is well alive and if you provide us a, a level playing field then we can show you that we can also compete very very well and create our own systems that can be uh, operational in complete parallel to your system, right? Uh, completely independent from your system. And there is absolutely nothing you can do about it. All right. Um, I'm not sure if Kevin is there, so then yeah, please continue. Yeah. All yeah, right. That was excellent. I'm here. Um, so, Yuri, um, you, you've you also, you know, uh, somewhat elucidated about the, the free private cities or citadels. Uh, we had talks you know, together with Stephanie, with uh, Jeff Booth, and, <clears throat> and you know, the author of Price of Tomorrow, Why Deflation is the Key to an Abundant Future, and with Titus Gable, uh, who created, you know, founded the free private cities, who actually, I think, has just started with one or two or three projects. Um, you know, the, the state as a territorial monopolist on violence, aggression, coercion. I mean, every criminal deed and act you can think of, um, I, I don't think it hasn't felt the threat of Bitcoin yet. So it's about to come. So there are some people, uh, even in the you know more prominent, uh, I think I even heard Gary V, you know, the social media marketing guru, I don't think he understands Bitcoin, but he says that uh, he thinks that definitely the, the states are going to ban it. And especially countries like China, Russia and a couple of other countries, you know, uh, who are known, you know, for for their, uh, you know, very severe op oppressive and surveillance panopticon, uh, George Orwell style regimes. Um where do you see this going? I mean, do you what's what's the process? Is it uh, are we going like more and more to localize more and more decentralized, granular decentralized free private cities, where we can you know evolve into deflationary economics, uh, defend defend ourselves with higher grade 
you know, technological uh, <laughs> defense technologies. I mean, what what's the practicality of it? What, 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 how do you, where do you see us in 10 years from now? Are we going literally to fight against the state, you know, the, or the central banks who have criminal immunity over everything? Yeah, well, I think um, in, uh, I think uh, the heavy lifting will be done by Bitcoin itself uh, because of its uh, game theoretic properties. And by that, I mean, uh, Bitcoin is uh, essentially designed to pump forever. That's the so-called uh, number go up technology of uh, Bitcoin, right? So uh, it is a deflash, deflationary currency in terms of uh, uh, that it's going to absorb more and more assets into it and it's going to grow up in value. And that means that uh, it doesn't matter who you are. You can be a politician, you can be a CEO of a large company like Michael Saylor of uh, MicroStrategy, you can be just a, you know, a regular guy from the street. You will be interested in Bitcoin and you will be interested in getting some Bitcoin. So I am very, very confident that right now uh, a lot of politicians already have uh, exposure to Bitcoin. Uh, Russian politicians, Chinese politicians, uh, US politicians, you name it. And that's the game theory behind Bitcoin. Do they want to shoot themselves in the foot by outright banning Bitcoin? I don't think they do. So uh, obviously there's close to 200 countries in the world. So uh, some countries may experiment with completely banning Bitcoin. Like I think they, it has been done in countries like Ecuador. But uh, others will see the benefit of not banning Bitcoin, but maybe do some kind of a partial... Um, uh, partial uh, regulations, right? They will be like Russia, for example, is not discussing banning Bitcoin outright, but they are discussing uh, not allowing people to use Bitcoin as a payment method, right? So that uh, Bitcoin is not uh, does not compete with the Russian ruble as a payment method, but you still are able to uh, store and to hold Bitcoin uh, for yourself, right? Uh, basically, as an investment. What does that mean? Well, that probably means that. Uh, Russian politicians already have some Bitcoin and they don't want to ban it uh, so that they can, caught, can get caught themselves, right? And, you know, uh, they don't want to spoil their own lives. But at the same time, they don't really care about spending it in stores. So they're like, well, we're going to ban it. We don't care about spending it. So we just, you know, ban at least the, uh, the uh, spendability uh, of uh, Bitcoin on the territory of Russia. And so like that, there will be... Uh, many different uh, options, many different variants of uh, of uh, uh, Bitcoin bans and Bitcoin regulations, but the same. But uh, you must understand that they, I don't think they will be able to actually completely ban it simply because Bitcoin will keep going up and more and more of them will have to have exposure to Bitcoin. But uh, when we talk about, uh, you know, uh, the resistance to the state, uh, uh, obviously it's not an easy task. And uh, I don't see Bitcoin as being that uh, uh, singular savior of humanity. Um, uh, there are a bunch of people who think that, well, all we need to do is just uh, stack some Bitcoins, sit tight, and uh, essentially Bitcoin will do the job for us, right? We just spend a few years, uh, you know, um, uh, sitting in our bunkers and uh, the, the Bitcoin uh, economy will do its magic and uh, the state will suddenly disappear and that's it. <laughs> you know, the, uh, the, the elites are gone and we can enjoy our Bitcoin future. But I don't think it's that simple. The thing is that uh, the people who are at the, uh, you know, at the top of this uh, power structure of this pyramid, they uh, have been there for uh, decades, if not centuries, right? And uh, it's not like they are ready to give up their uh, reins so easily. Um, they, I think they will do their best to resist it. And uh, uh, they are already doing it, I believe. The, we have seen a bunch of uh, attacks on Bitcoin, whether political or speculative or um, uh, otherwise. And I think they are not... Uh, uh, they were not uh, coincidental and I don't think they were very, you know, I don't think it was just a bunch of ignorant people deciding that they want to rule Bitcoin and that's it. I think it was uh, fairly coordinated, you know, and uh, that's uh, that's that was only the beginning. Uh, gladly, Bitcoin came out even stronger from these attacks, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, but uh, we can't guarantee that none of this will happen again. More and more things will happen again. Uh, what I mean is that... Uh, 
having Bitcoin is great and we should all have it and is the first step towards uh, uh, towards liberty and freedom. But uh, you have to also take care to uh, work on other facets of your life. And those are uh, things like, uh, you know, uh, personal defense uh, systems. It's, uh, you know, uh, food production. And uh, there's, uh, uh, you know, work on your mind, work on your body, uh, all kinds of things. Work on your family, right? Uh, raise the next generation uh, that will be not as brainwashed as the previous one, right? Um, there's many, many different things that you can do to actually prepare for that good future because it's not going to come by itself. And Bitcoin is not an organic entity that actually thinks, right? That that is going that can read your mind and that will bring this beautiful future for you. It's still up to individuals themselves who hold Bitcoin. Um, what when you ask me what I see in ten years? Um, you know, I don't think that in ten years we will have uh, you know hundreds or thousands of these uh, citadels and free private cities around the world because the process is not very very uh, swift. Uh, yes, hyper uh, hyperinflation may be a swift process, but we can already see all the signs that there is another financial system uh, in the pipeline. They are already calling calling it right. They are saying, "Okay, it's going to be the great reset and, and things like that." So it's not like they don't have a plan for it. Obviously, they know that the uh, fiat system can't go on forever. So they have to repackage it and remodel it and do all kinds of things like uh, debt forgiveness and things like that uh, to uh, create a new system, which is not obviously going to be better than the old system. As a matter of fact, it will be much worse because it will have, uh, it will give them a lot more power in terms of surveillance capabilities and, uh, uh, and uh, other things and tracking. But uh, uh, so it's not going to be very easy, and we, we have to do a little more than that. Uh, uh, that's why I believe that uh, maybe in the first stages of it, uh, uh, there will be two economies existing in parallel. The first one is a compliant Bitcoin economy, and the second one is a non-compliant Bitcoin economy. So the non-compliant one will be essentially the you know what's called the black market today, but... Uh, um, you, you have to remember that the black market is actually a very, very large piece of the market, right? For example, um, uh, in Greece, 30% uh, of the whole GDP is black market, right? <laughs> it's, a, it's a huge piece of it. And uh, uh, Russia is the same. Uh, a lot of the market is black or gray. So uh, it's just going to be people uh, who say, well, you know, I don't want to do this uh, like KYC, AML stuff and provide my KYC documentation when I want to buy, uh, you know, a piece of bread with my Bitcoin. Uh, I'm just gonna I'm not going to do it. And suddenly you have the black market for bread <laughs> and Bitcoin, right? So it's very, very simple. But um, um, so this process is very long and uh, and uh, the 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 elites they will do their best and it will take a lot of uh, a lot of effort to actually defeat them so i think uh, at first we'll have these two economies coexisting but slowly but surely over the next decades i think the this black market and the the, the, the actual the free economy will consume the old economy because uh, purely because of incentives right uh, the the, the individuals, the people, they will see that, well, you know, those those guys that don't comply, they actually have a kind of a maybe a better life. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's uh, it seems like it's illegal not uh, to, to do so, right, what they are doing. But nothing really happens either because... Uh, uh, because it's Bitcoin, it, it really can't be controlled that much as a, as a centralized fiat currency, right? So they're just, uh, you know, going about their life just like... Right now, people on Craigslist trade day and night, and no one, no one does any harm to them. Right? It's, uh, uh, it's uh, this economy exists and has always existed. So I think the non-compliant Bitcoin economy will slowly suck the life out of, out of the compliant one, and uh, eventually, you know, over some time, the whole economy will will just be one Bitcoin economy, and with that, will come all kinds of. Uh, uh, market rather than government solutions to all kinds of problems and free private cities and citadels is one solution to such a problem in this case the solution to a problem of uh, living together essentially right like titus geber likes to call it the market of living together 
will evolve and that's what i see happening as well um but uh, even by his experience you can see that you know just simply uh annexing a piece of land and calling it your country is not going to work right now because uh, the states have a lot of uh resources they have a lot of power they have all the military and they will crush you in one day you can't fight a fight that you cannot win so you have to fight your fight a little bit on a different scale probably with a longer term horizon and uh, with a different means bitcoin is one side yeah you made some excellent points especially you know especially what's uh, regarding the skin in the game you know because there are a lot of politicians or you know, political decision makers and especially the daughters and sons you know the younger generation with the you call them millennial or whatever generation X or whatever they're called. So they are already fully uh, skin in the game, uh, and uh, they have you know bought into Bitcoin. So they are they are they are already you know um, they are in this game already. Um, there was something else I was going to tell, but uh, Shepany, do you, did you want to add something to that? Yeah, um, actually, just an hour ago, I posted something on Twitter, like how the libertarian principle treats land property. And they say that land becomes one's property as soon as one has put some work into it, some, some transformative work. Let's say you are doing some agriculture and you're using this land to um, plant some some wheat for example then this becomes your land or when you build your house on that and have your garden then this is also becoming your land because you're putting the work into it and this also means that you cannot say that all these hectares just belong to me right now because i say so and because i um, apply people to protect it when i'm not using it and i thought this was very interesting on how a natural order would evolve um, in terms of land property and this very much goes together with the um, free private cities and citadels um, but of course right now we have the state which is a um, territorial monopolist that uses his monopoly on violence to preserve its power over the certain territory and um, of course it doesn't work as you said um, right now but it's important um, to have in mind how it would be in a normal order this is why I wanted to press this right now on um, that we can have a vision on how a normal order without a state would look like where people are free and where um because the land is kind of for everyone we, are, we don't have like so many people that there wouldn't be the possibility for everyone to have some space i mean right now we have this already and there's like so much land which is not used so this is not so much of an issue and I think um, many people don't have this in the back of their mind, but it's important to know how it would be. So I also agree with you that I don't think that the state will continue to have its power as it has right now. Um, I think Yuri is gone, but I, I just continue it nevertheless, right? I think uh, some internet problem. Okay, so I'm off. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, yeah, I was muted. No, I think he's going to be back. <laughs> I think he has the same bandwidth issue, like like in my case. So I think he's just going to come back. Yeah. Um, so I agree that the state will lose its power. I mean, we have to also think, what is a state? We can have a minimal state where uh, the state focuses on preserving um, some kind of law structure. Um, but there are actually contradictions between the state and law structure. So the state would need to preserve that the property of, of its um, citizens are, are not harmed. But on the other side, the state claims taxes, which is a dispossession. So the state, as we know it, doesn't there are contradictions, it just doesn't fit its parents. So um, and right now we have a state that was like growing very, very large. So I'm curious how it will develop. Um, I thought that there would be like radical, radical split offs in parallel societies. That, that is what I was saying in March. But right now, I see it more likely that we actually have a reduction of the state. Many people think like, how can you say this right now when we went so totalitarian? But there's a lot of things happening in the background. Um, 
when you do a lot of research and look really closely, you can see some of these things. But there are an, even in alternative news, you don't see so much of that. So um, this will it will be a great surprise, I think, in the in the next month for us to see. And I think we will have a reduction of state actually. And then there are like many possibilities opening up. I mean. My Markus Kral said this, that we kind of have this minimal state when there is the option to do secessions and make even smaller states. And then you have at least a competition between states. So this is also already an advantage. It's already a little bit better. But I'm certainly on the side to completely transcend the state. So because the state is a state as a construct where a few people can impose their will on the West, essentially, because they can decide the rules. And um, this is what I consider as a state. So uh, and in the free private cities, it's different or it can be different. I mean, there can be some that have a state kind of form, but there can be some where um, you have a bilateral contract where um, the government service provider or let's say citadel service provider, because it's really not a government as we know it. And they say, okay, we, we protect your life, liberty and property. So they just have some security. and. Um, then they have some courts in the back or they just offer it. That could also like really come from the private market as well. But there, there is at least something on how to um, like make sure that some kind of order is followed. And of course, there would be also kind of a rule set. So um, of course, you cannot steal. The property of the other has to be preserved. These kind of things. And you sign it and then you enter the, the free private city and then you have to obey to these rules. And any free private city can have different, but they cannot be changed by like a small party. Um, but they would need to be changed with everyone in a bilateral contract. And this is the super huge difference between free private city where there is a service provider who only provides the service of security and nothing more. There's no imposition of will. And this is the great difference to a government and also a minimal state. And this is also the reason why I say this is where what is good or what is the best for the people, for the freedom of the people, because this is not an input where someone imposes their real will. And it's also not. Yeah, the, you know, the excellent discussion point, because, uh, um, you know, we talked with Markus Kral and Thorsten Porlet, and Thorsten Porlet, and you know, is, is, you, you also, Stephanie, you read his book, and, uh, you know, with money to um, world dominance, I mean, it's a German title, uh, uh, but he's saying sort of that everything that the government is supposed to deliver or to provide, actually, a, a pro private contractual service provider can do that much, much, much better especially in the deflationary economics rooted in a hardest and scarcest money, Bitcoin, you know, um, we, I mean, people can't even fathom, they can't even imagine with, that we can have an abundant civilization society where uh, services and products get better and better, more innovative. And, and we don't even actually need any kind of, you know, state-based uh, entities, whether it be ju judicial, executive or legislative. I mean, what's what's your take on that? Well, yeah, I completely agree. I mean, uh, uh, I pretty much agree with uh, what at least uh, Titus Gebel described in his book, uh, "Free Private Cities," and what uh, uh, Hans Hermann Hoppe described in uh, "Democracy: The God That Failed," uh, one of my favorite books too. Uh, this this is where it all leads uh, because uh, uh, at the end of the day, uh, it's quite obvious, and that's uh, you know the the main talking point of uh, all Austrian economists is that the vast majority, if not all services uh, are better provided by the private market, by, by the free market rather than by the state. And this can be clearly demonstrated in absolutely any country you go, whether it's the United States or Russia. Anything that's uh, done by the government is complete nonsense. <laughs> it's total trash pretty much uh, compared to anything done by private individuals by private enterprise um, and I'm not talking about uh, private enterprise that is uh, in bed with the government that's already more a bit about uh, crony capitalism you know these large corporations that are right now uh, participating pretty much in the so-called great reset they are you know not really part of the free enterprise right they are already uh, quite in bed with the government they subsidize they are subsidized by by the government and they do the bidding of the government in many respects. Uh, however, 
the little guy, the medium-sized guy, so to speak, uh, the the actual private market uh, that uh, that's out there. Those are the guys that can, I think, uh, change a lot of things. And uh, uh, when it comes to the market of living together, of course, it's it's a uh, it's the same premise, right? It's uh, uh, let's uh, let's take uh, a bunch of uh, places and uh, let's. Uh, you know, make uh, this place with these rules and this place with these rules and see whichever works better. Uh, you can have your communist citadel and you can have your uh, free market citadel. And, and uh, I'm sure in a couple of years, uh, it will be completely clear which one actually prevails, right? Um, obviously the latter. <laughs> but, uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, what, what we want to see, of course, is a world of tens of thousands of these citadels rather than the world of a couple hundred states that are uh, managed pretty much by the same circles of uh, elites and financial interests, uh, you know. Um, but uh, uh, this, uh, this is a process and it has to start somewhere. And uh, I think actually right now the way my thought process goes is that uh, it's... Uh, quite impossible to start uh, right now today uh, to you know just gla grab land and the hope that the state is not going to touch you for that right they're going to destroy you right away but we already have certain tools like we like the internet and bitcoin and what we can start is uh, what uh, i like to call digital citadels these digital communities and digital countries and they are not just uh, simply uh, interest-based groups like it's not a ping pong group or a dog lovers group it's an actual group that uh, uh, has individuals that share the same uh, values and cultural norms and maybe even language or whatnot but uh, they share more broad broad kind of uh, uh, features among themselves right and they can live in different parts of the world uh, they can be from anywhere as long as they share a, a basic set of principles and, and rules and they follow those uh, um, uh, to the T and if someone decides to, to break those rules they get expelled essentially so this can be a good start for building a citadel in the cloud a digital citadel and that's uh, uh, I think a lot of people actually look for these kind of things and I can already see uh, some of these uh, digital citadels appearing online and uh, uh, I am invited to some of them too, and uh, it's uh, it's very interesting to see because uh, uh, because uh, people start realizing that uh, we can create our own parallel societies, societies that do not comply, that do not uh, follow the same standards and rules that the mainstream. Uh, society is following right now and I think it's very important because at some point if you get a bunch of let's say Bitcoiners form a parallel society then in 10 years these bunch of Bitcoins will be a bunch of very very wealthy people and these very wealthy people will be able to uh, to uh, you know uh, provide uh, all kinds of resources to actually make a real physical citadel uh real right to make it uh, uh to make it happen to build it and uh, how will that happen no one can know but you know various scenarios can happen for example you know some uh, small african or caribbean country goes through hyperinflation and for them uh, and the leaders of this country really, really want to get their hands on some Bitcoin, but, you know, no one wants their currency. No, They have no resources. They only have fish around them, right, because they're on an island. <laughs> so, and then the Bitcoiners come in and say, hey, well, you know, you have, a, you have a bunch of these islands that you don't use really, right? Give them to us, but don't lease them to us. Don't, don't sell them to us and, and keep the dominion over these islands actually sell them to us and declare them as not yours anymore like literally uh you know they become ours and we can build our own country on those islands right and i bet that uh, you know within a couple of decades such cases will start appearing and people will uh, and these uh, these uh, these uh, citadels will appear. Uh, maybe not in Russia. You know, Russia is a, still a huge and, and and very kind of strong and centralized uh, uh, 
country, right? Like there's still this fight between Russia and Japan over some uh, uh, islands uh, next to Japan, right? Uh, that uh, none of them want to uh, cede to each other. Uh, and that's why Russia and Japan still haven't signed a peace agreement since the Second World War. They're still technically at war, <laughs> but uh, uh, just because of those islands, right? So Russia understands that if it gives up those uh, those islands, then China will come and says, hey, we want part of Siberia. Then someone else will come and say, hey, we want part of this and part of that. So, but if you take this uh, small countries somewhere in uh, uh, the Caribbean or the Indian Ocean or, you know, uh, some African maybe continents, such a thing as, I think is quite possible because a lot of them are already quite corrupt, right? And they, uh, they literally exist based on uh, certain business models like... Uh, you know, um, uh, offshore company uh, registrations and uh, uh, being uh, unregulated financial sectors, uh, which I, I am in favor of, obviously. <laughs> Regulation does not uh, bring anything positive, really. Uh, but uh, uh, that, that's what I'm saying. These scenarios are pretty uh, realistic and uh, they become realistic only thanks to Bitcoin. Because, uh, um, you know, as, uh, as myself and some others in the Bitcoin community, we actually think that if Bitcoin were not around right now, our future may be a little bit darker than it, it could be, right? At least now we have a chance. Now we have a... Uh, Bitcoin is our light at the end of the tunnel, essentially, and we are really, really happy that it's here. So we, as a generation, uh, you know, see ourselves as this a, a part of this kind of important history, right? Uh, history may turn around thanks to Bitcoin and we are part of that history and our goal, uh, our purpose in life is to make that happen, to use Bitcoin as a tool, uh, as a tool for secession from the old paradigm and into the new one. I agree with you. And we have this one shot. I mean, I, and you know, there's, uh, I think even Jeff Booth said in one of his last interviews, he said that, you know, if they really try to ban or, you know, regulate self custody of your own Bitcoin, I mean, the first thing he would do, he would just, you know, emigrate or, you know, take his stuff with his family and just go to another country with it, be Portugal, any other country. So we'll go in to see, I think, more. I think it's called jurisdictional arbitrage or localized economies, or as you, you know, as you're describing, you know, uh, there might be more and more small countries. Well, you know, I've just read about Venezuela and Iran. They're now, if I don't know if that's a rumor or a really a official report that they've already start, started exchanging uh, Bitcoin for for trade, in, right? So it doesn't matter. You know, Iran has already started um, um, uh, paying or, or actually mandating uh, their the official Bitcoin miners in Iran, you know, at a specific, specified price that they're going to buy from them Bitcoin, so in order to circumvent uh, the sanctions and embargoes, so a lot of things are are taking place not only on you know geopolitical, economical, but I think especially technological level. And I think we're going to get into that from store of value to medium of exchange phase much much faster than we can even imagine. I mean, the things that are right now happening is mind blowing. You know, um, so yeah, Stephanie, um, did you want to ask? So sorry, ask something. Yeah, um, so I also read your article on monarchy. So I'm not sure if I understood this correctly, how you understand this, like monarchy in a free private city. So I already laid out that I consider this um, service provider of the citadel is not being able to impose its will onto the people. So there's like a bilateral contract. And so this is not what I understand as monarchy, because I understand monarchy as, again, a small group of people, maybe like one, one king and the princess or whatever, imposing their will on the rest. Um, I'm, I agree with you that this is certainly better than democracy, where it's like a, a competition for the worst, as we learn um, from Hans Hermann Hoppe. Um, but nevertheless, the monarchy has this principle um, that uh, some people impose their will on others. If they continue to do this over a too long time, there will be kind of a revolution. This is different with democracy because it's only a limited time. So this is kind of one of the reasons why a monarchy um, has some superior features. Um, so what I definitely 
would say i i mean there are people who would like to um experience this or would also like to experience communism and they can do so in their free private city or in well it's, it shouldn't be called free in their citadel <laughs> and then they see how it is like and then when i don't see it doesn't that's not what I want and they can go out so I'm totally fine with this but I was a little bit confused how you understand this um, and if yeah maybe you can elaborate a little bit on this yeah and um, I think uh, there's two sides of it the first one is a bit technical and the second one is more philosophical uh, so the technical side of it is that obviously you know taken to its logical conclusion the world of citadels in which every single citadel is private, run by either a private corporation or a private individual who owns the citadel and provides services to the people, and people pay a subscription fee to that service. That's kind of the the ultimate logical conclusion of this, right? Uh, where 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 we want it to be headed. But uh, we all understand, also, you know, uh, grounded in realism a little bit, is that uh, the Complete ideals are very, very hard to reach sometimes. Uh, and usually what happens in the world, in, in the real life, is, uh, is sort of a mixture of uh, something, right? Not, not a complete ideal. Uh, so, uh, and when, when we talk about monarchy, monarchy is uh, one system that is at least closer to that described in, you know, in, to that uh, system of uh, citadels. It's, it's definitely not ideal and not perfect in any way. Um, it's uh, still uh, pretty much a statism uh, when, when you talk about it. But if you compare it to what we have right now uh, and you, you know, look back and say uh, like the Middle Ages, the Italy of Middle Ages or other European parts of the Middle Ages where uh, every city was essentially its own little country right its own principality or it could be governed by its own uh, little uh, curia or like a little committee not even committee committees i don't like the word committee but you know uh, a council let's say uh, a council of elders for example uh that that's pretty much what i mean by monarchy a little principality is you know uh, the the piece of land is still owned by a private individual who would be a prince. If it's a small piece of land or if it's a larger, then there can be king, right? Uh, so, and the people, the, the thing with this uh, Middle Age uh, uh, city-states is that there was no such thing as passports. There was no such thing as citizenship. People voluntarily chose to live there because it was, you know, one of them was nicer than the other one. And if they didn't like the taxes that were imposed by the prince, for, uh, in that uh, city-state, they were free to move. Whereas right now, you're not free to move because now you have a, essentially like a cow, you have a stamp on yourself, right? In, in the form of a birth certificate and a passport. And you are a serial number to the state and nothing more. Uh, so before, everybody was free to leave the principality if they didn't like it. And right now it's different. So this is what I mean in terms of the, in terms of a monarchy, this type of monarchy rather than rather than, you know, uh, having some kind of a king and, uh, you know, who still uses the contemporary passport and visa system and all that stuff that completely restricts uh, all uh, uh, freedoms of uh, his uh, constituents. Um, but the second part of uh, this argument is also a little bit more philosophical and goes back maybe to, uh, you know, Plat uh, Plato's uh, Republic, where uh, in which essentially we're talking about... Uh, uh, kings and queens in terms of philosopher kings, right? So the philosopher kings, as if you remember, I, I mentioned about how you know the vast majority of people are essentially uh, blind followers, right? Uh, and uh, maybe the term sheep is kind of a derogatory, but uh, the, at the same time, it describes it uh, pretty pretty clearly, right? And the sheep needs a shepherd, and that philosopher king who is this uh you know essentially great guy who is uh, really experienced in all kinds of matters in business and maybe in military and in finance and uh, uh, and what's most important is that uh, he's uh, morally superior than the others he has the ethical standards and the you know the resolve of uh, the soul that like, will basically make him a good leader, a good king. That's what I mean by this type of monarchy where a philosopher king, so you, he's, he's a shepherd, he leads the people, 
uh, right? He is an example to follow. So uh, I think that's a very important distinction here because right now, uh, if you you know if you take a regular an average state anywhere in the world, the leaders that go there are the, essentially the complete opposite of what I just described, right? They are politicians, and right now in the political system, if you want to go to the top. Uh, you have to be the exact opposite of what I just described. You have to be uh, sneaky. You have to be uh, lying and cheating, and you have to, you know, you have to sell yourself pretty much all the time. So uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's it's very important, I think, to uh, for us to get back to this uh, uh, feeling of uh, kind of natural nobility, right? The natural. Uh, leadership because right now they're trying to make everybody the same right you know men have to be women women have to be men and uh, you know and uh, all that stuff uh, but uh, there is there are people who are excellent and there are people who are not excellent right and the excellent people who are really excellent not because you know they they say that they are but actually recognized as excellent by other people they have to be uh, probably at the front and uh, and the you know in the leading positions of uh, some of these uh, institutions and some of these uh, some of these uh, city states and and citadels right so they in the minds of other people they will be looked at as kings they don't have to bear the title of a king they can be you know the ceo of a citadel or they can be president of a citadel or a prince or a king it doesn't matter the title uh, what matters is the philosophical uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, the philosophical grounds upon which uh, this guy or, or that guy is actually the leader uh, and not uh, uh, you know and, and not uh, the uh, democratic system of uh, you know universal suffrage that just decided okay you know let's uh, let's bribe half of the population to vote for this guy and this vote, this guy is now the president and you know and uh, he has no merit he has no strengths he has nothing he was just put there uh, by someone else and that's it right so um, I think the term for it is uh, uh, natural elite uh, I think this term was also uh, uh, um, uh, described by Hans Hermann Hoppe. Yeah, so uh, uh, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, I hope it clears it up a little bit. Yeah, very much. Thank you so much. So I totally agree that we need leaders. I mean, every organization needs to have kind of a structure and a mission statement, and this has to be held by a person, usually the CEO or whoever founded this organization. And as we said, this free private city is a service provider, and there's also a CEO who holds this whole mission and idea and thinks about how to make these contracts, which uh, police to employ which security to employ let's say that's maybe the better word and also which courts to have in the back um, of the organization so that they can be at hand when there is like a conflict so I totally agree with that that we need um, strong leaders or but not like forceful leaders that some push something through um, without talking with the people but compassionate leaders that are listening, that have the ideas and perspectives of um, everyone in their um, reach in mind. So everyone who is in this organization, may, no matter whether it's a business or whether it is this free private city. So yeah, I agree with you on this. That's, that's very interesting, yeah. Yeah, thanks for the clarification, Yuri, because uh, we just wanted to understand, like, what, are, what is your thought process behind that? So um, I want to wrap this up. Um, any final thoughts, Yuri? Where do you, um, yeah, where do you see this, you know, bit, where do you see Bitcoin evolving? Do you see, like, critical adoption rates in five to ten years' time? Do you, do you see unexpected things evolving in the next few years? Yeah, well, um I'm uh, I'm starting to think in terms of uh, no forceful adoption. So I'm uh, not really a proponent of mass adoption uh, in terms of you know let's let's just do everything we can for mass adoption to happen. I think Bitcoin is uh, self-explanatory to those people who want to see the truth behind it, and uh, the rest 
uh, will actually follow into Bitcoin and they will be forced onto Bitcoin by the economic reality. And the economic reality will be such that uh, fiat currencies will collapse. Uh, the stock market will collapse because it's also propped up by fake money anyway. Um, and uh, a lot of the value in the world will essentially disappear. Um, and at least a lot of the fake value will disappear. A lot of the real value will be shaken off and maybe go into Bitcoin. And uh, that's why Bitcoin will keep rising in its value. And if it cannot be measured in the United States dollars, because the United States dollars doesn't exist anymore, then it's going to be measured against something else, maybe even against gold. And that's why a lot of people are now interested in comparing Bitcoin to the gold uh, market cap and uh, they measure it against gold. Uh, and uh, simply that, uh, you know, the, the, the average person will only look at the number uh, go up, you know, the, the, you know, what's the price today? What's the price tomorrow? Oh, the price has been growing for the past, uh, you know, couple of years. I better just jump on Bitcoin, right? And that's it. That's the simple solution for the average person. The few who actually understand Bitcoin and want to dig deeper into it, I think uh, will play a bigger role in what's coming. And um, uh, yeah, I think uh, we, we have to just find more of those people, more of people, of those people who actually are ready to spend a little more energy and uh, effort on uh, uh, on turning Bitcoin into this, uh, um, uh, turning Bitcoin into a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Because it still needs a lot of uh, work. It still needs lots of development. Uh, the technology is still a bit clunky. The user interface, the user experience is still a little bit clunky. People still lose money with Bitcoin. Um, it's still not for everyone. You cannot trust it to your grandma just yet, right? It's it's just uh, it's just not there, and uh, you know, and it's already eleven years old, right? So it has to take a little more time. Has to be a little slower, uh, and mass adoption will follow. Like I said, uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's not something that we have to rush. It's something that we have to take slowly but surely. Um, as Parker Lewis called his uh, series of articles, suddenly, uh, gradually, then suddenly. Excellent. Beautifully said. Uh, where can people find you? Where, where are your uh, resources, podcasts, articles, Twitter? Yeah, my website is uh, degaya.co and you can find me on Twitter, y underscore degaya. And my podcast is called The Citadelium. It's about Bitcoin and Citadels. And uh, you can find it on all, all uh, major platforms like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Anchor FM, as well as YouTube and uh, uh, BitChute. Excellent. Yeah, and your article is also published on uh, citadel21.com. Uh, I urge everyone to read that. It's an excellent article. Bitcoin is a tool for secession. Uh, yeah, Stephanie, do you have any final thoughts so we can wrap this up? Really yeah, um, actually, I have one quote that I would like to mention now, which is from this article, Bitcoin as a tool for secession. You are writing, the process of personal secession is the creation of a citadel of the mind first and foremost, a fortress of light impenetrable to the forces of darkness. I thought that it was just uh, really a nice thought and um, to stress how we have to take care of our thoughts and our consciousness and this also made me thinking that you cannot solve the same problems with the same state of consciousness but you have to go beyond and clear your mind and your ideas and then you can create something new and then you can create also a better future so first it starts in your mind and then it manifests in the outside so i think this was really very nice all right well thank you uh, both of you uh uh, Yuri, maybe we can repeat this uh, panel discussions or any kind of discussions in the future. We really enjoyed this. You're really a, a big enrichment to, the, to this whole big, uh, Bitcoin space and to the intellectual space, to the, you know, to the evolution of Bitcoin. So thank you so much again to both of you and talk to you soon, hopefully. Thank you, Kevan. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you. Bye. Bye. All right. Bye bye. Okay. Um, Stephanie, we can wrap this up. Do you want to uh, share your thoughts after this talk? Yeah. I, was I sit here. 
Um, yeah, I, I hear you. <laughs> I mean, many of the things we already discussed with uh, Titus Geber, but it was it's always uh, very nice to hear this from a different perspective. So what was new for me was this idea of monarchy, and I'm really happy that I asked to understand what he means with that. And um, because I, I pushed it in the wrong way, of course, because monarchy um, is usually, I mean, we didn't have so many bene benevolent kings. There were many that were really exploitive and uh, didn't treat their citizens well. Um, but the way Yuri meant this was more from a benevolent um, leadership kind of way. And it didn't really necessarily meant to include that this king could change the rules so he cannot say that there are more taxes or whatever because um, the rules are set in advance in this bilateral contract so this is also what he prefers but of course um, we can have uh, many different citadels and for all those that um, still think that communism is good i mean they should do the experience themselves and be free to go out again and then <laughs> we we hopefully this is i think this is probably the best way for everyone to wake up that the socialism communism yeah, idea is actually you know, exactly that's the essence actually of liberty and free choice right without um, you know um, without damaging anyone else or without uh, obstructing anyone else, without stealing from anyone else. You know, I think everybody should have uh, the right and, you know, and the freedom to, to, to test, to experiment, to, you know, within their own <laughs> uh, space and create their own space uh, of, 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 you know, of existence, of uh, enjoyment, of whatever, of uh, structural um, development. So, yeah, I, I really loved his thought process, you know, the, this, structural transitioning you know into into uh, a stateless um, uh, world where you know where we can eventually thrive and blossom into a uh, yeah into a really sound monet uh, monetary system uh, which is Bitcoin you know and 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 truly in, and truly liberate ourselves from this brainwashing indoctrination, which has, which, you know, which the governments and the state and this whole structure, you know, has has imbued upon us. So, yeah, you really made some excellent points. I mean, your, your questions were really uh, inspirational. Thank you so much again, Stephanie. And <laughs> yeah, repeat this. Okay. Yeah. Okay, Stephanie. Talk I have to you soon. that I would like to share. Yeah. It fits so well. Um, so he was stressing the importance of leadership, and we have to ask ourselves who will be the leaders who build this new future. So Marcos Kral also said we need competent people, and actually it doesn't matter which education you have because the education was mainly brainwashing. So those people that are awakened now. It is, they can be of great service to all of humanity by educating themselves and then contributing and making a better future. And to be honest, to also hold the space for others to follow because it is quite intense to realize the absolute intensity of deception we were groomed in. I mean, for people that I have uh, very close, they were like so shocked to realize that the state is not benevolent. This was actually kind of a trauma. They needed to go through this. And there are even worse things that will be revealed. But it is important to know that everything needs to be revealed to see the truth and then change it. So no matter how tough the revelations will be, we can we just need to see it as it is and build a better future. And so uh, big thanks to everyone who's listening. And um, yeah, so and also big thanks for all their contribution to this positive change, because this is actually all that Bitcoin and your podcast is about. We are like um, focusing on, on and change on how to um, achieve that and also to have this paradigm shift. So also thank you so much, Kevin, for your service of uh, doing this podcast regularly. <laughs> yeah. No, thank you so much, uh, Stephanie, for your kind words and your really excellent, beautifully uh, beautiful conclusion. And yeah, we are the essence, you know, we're the seed, I think, of, 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 um, of um, uh, transformation and evolution. And uh, it just takes time and 
yes, and I need to remind myself, you know, just be patient and uh, work on ourselves and just, you know, create. Um, uh, because, you know, our, we are, at, you know, at the end of the day, we are mortal. We, we, you know, we might live 100, 120. I don't know, my grandma, my grand grandma lived 120 years old. So I think wow. we need to make the best out of it. Yeah, she, she, was, she lived in Iran. Uh, I think she, she was like 118 th years old, somewhere in the mountains of Iran. So, yeah, and we got to make the best out of it, you know. And it's it's. Uh, but I think the, the the strength of of vision, of intention, of of comprehension, and on every level you can think of, even psychological, emotionally, spiritually, is so so uh, you know uh, underestimated and important in uh, in you know in the manifestation process. So thank you so much.